Well, I don't know how your pastor does it, but uh, somehow every time he emails, he usually sends out an email to all the missionaries and he says, you know, this is going to be our missions month. And, uh, you know, if you can send us some prayer requests or some updates or if you happen to be in Australia, um, every time he's done that, it just happens that I've just booked tickets and I'm going to be in Australia. So uh, um, it just uh, sort of worked that way. And so uh, I'm thankful to uh, have the opportunity and the privilege to be able to be here with you guys today. Um, give you a few updates quickly before we uh, jump into the Word of God. Uh, we're going to start off in Matthew 28, so you can start flicking there if you want. Uh, but uh, a few updates. Um, obviously, uh, our daughter Nicole has uh, just come out of surgery, um, and uh, surgery was a, a real success. Um, they actually um, gave us a, a 5% chance that she wouldn't have um, disease cells inside her ear. Um, it's an inner ear infection growth that, that continues to grow, sort of similar to a tumor, uh, but it's not cancerous. And uh, after looking at uh, MRI scans and that, they said, uh, we're pretty sure it's there, 5% chance that it's not going to be there. And uh, so they went ahead with the surgery, and uh, lo and behold, it's not there. Uh, it was funny because I had church members in Vanuatu saying, Pastor, you go do the surgery. Uh, they're not going to find anything. It's going to be clean. Um, so it was clean, but praise God, they did the surgery because they actually found out that the implant that they had put on her, on her, uh, on her left ear had not taken. Um, and so they actually had to pull that out and put in a new implant. Uh, give you an idea, she can't, she can't hear sort of rubbing if you rub on the side of your ear. Now she can uh, even with uh, swabs of cotton and a big bandage, uh, she's already got better hearing. It was one of the first things she said as she was sort of coming, you know, sort of waking up from that. She said, well, I can hear a lot better already and I have all this cotton and stuff uh, down her ear. So um, that's the good news. That was a blessing. They had to reconstruct her eardrum with some cartilage and some different things that they do from there. Uh, the, uh, the bad news is they uh, went to work on her right ear. Uh, where there was a grommet and the grommet had actually retracted um, into, her, uh, into her inner ear canal. And so they removed that. Uh, so she has quite a big hole on her, on her right um, um, eardrum. And so they said there's probably going to be uh, further surgery, something similar to the one that they just did on the left ear um, later on. It's, it's always funny with surgeons. They don't tell you, uh, you know, oh, we're going to have to do surgery again because you're, you know, there on, in bed trying to recover from the first one. Um, but uh, so that's, uh, that's where we're at right now. Uh, it means that uh, the family can't fly for up to six weeks uh, with ear surgeries. It's uh, one of those things. We, we even looked into boats. We're like, can we get a boat back to Vanuatu? Like, how can we do this? And so the family is going to be staying here uh, over, over the next uh, six weeks. A family uh, in Ipswich kindly offered us a house uh, to be able to uh, stay uh, while we're here. And so um, I have to continue flying back and forth to Vanuatu. We actually, June, July, as we planned our years, always some of our busiest months because it's the cooler months. Uh, so that's when we get most of our visitors and people come over in teams. And uh, we knew this going into the year, but we we're on a waiting list. So we're like waiting, waiting, waiting. And sure enough, they gave us a surgery date, uh, right bang smack in the middle of, uh, of one of probably the most... Um, the most, uh, I guess, labor-intensive teams we've ever had come to Vanuatu. We've got a, a group of doctors from America coming over, 41 of them, uh, doctors and nurses uh, with, a, with a, a group called Medical uh, Mission Outreach. They go worldwide. And uh, so it's been uh, government paperwork. Um, we've had to get them all approved uh, to be able to come in. And, and uh, even the medications, they have to itemize and pricing and everything. And so uh, uh, we did a, a, a quick check of our, of our campsite there and uh, found out we didn't have enough mattresses. Um, our huts were kind of dilapidated. So we've uh, uh, re rebuilt them and tiled them. And, you know, because it's doctors, you know, you can't just sort of put them in a tent. Uh, that uh, won't go down too well especially when they asked us, what resorts do you guys have there? And we're kind of like, oh, well, we have a beach. So, you know, so we've uh, been doing a lot of cleaning and prepping and uh, they'll be coming in uh, a week's time. And so uh, that's all sort of happening in the background of, of this happening as well. So I go back to Vanuatu on Tuesday. Uh, the medical team comes in on Friday. Um, they're expecting to see up to a thousand people a day um, uh, with uh, just, uh, they've got eye clinics and things like that. And the main purpose for this team is to get the gospel out. Um, and for us, it's very exciting as a church because we, uh, we have a, a, a huge property that God's provided for us. Uh, we're debt free. We don't owe anything on the, on the buildings that we built. We, we built it in increments over the years. And uh, the biggest issue is people don't know where we are because we're off to the side, sort of in the 
back area. So uh, we actually pick up people for church uh, to come to our building. Uh, give you an idea, right now we have two vehicles and we bring between 120, 150 people to church on Sunday. So, uh, so you, you leave the bus uh, an hour before church starts to start doing the rounds to get everyone to church. Uh, and so um, this is going to, we're, we're really praying because this will put us on the map as far as our town, knowing that's where Luganville Baptist Church is, because um, that's where we're going to host the clinics. The Lord Mayor is going to come out with his whole cabinet, and uh, our provincial government is going to come out as well. Uh, so it's a really, really big event. And the main focus is to get the gospel to people. Uh, it was funny when they wrote to me and said, do you have 30 translators available for us? I was like, I don't have 30 people that speak English in my church. So that's going to be difficult. Uh, we said, might we stretch it to 20. Uh, but uh, so our, our church has been uh, preparing and everything for that. Uh, so that's happening real soon. Uh, so uh, uh, Nicole's surgery good. She's in a recovery process now. In two weeks' time, she'll go back for them to remove uh, surgical swabs that are actually inside her inner ear. Uh, so it's still a bit of a process um, uh, through that. Uh, I'll go back for this medical team. Uh, then after the medical team, we have a small church team comes in. And then after that church team, we have a school team that comes in. After that school team, we have a church from Tamworth that comes. So it's back to back. Uh, it's going to be busy. So pray for us in that regards, because at the same time, uh, church ministries don't stop. Uh, we're running discipleships and youth and kids programs, about seven uh, different kids programs in different schools and that. We run Bible school Sunday night. So all those things are still uh, running in the midst of teams coming in and things like that. Uh, just a quick uh, few updates in the last months. We had uh, uh, Pastor Pollock who, uh, who came from here to us. Thank you for sending him to us. Uh, we really appreciate that. We had a, a fantastic day with him as he taught on the family and, and different things that uh, uh, as our people in our church said, it was so simple, but yet it's stuff that we've never even thought about. Uh, you know, just concerning the family. Um, the uh, prayer request, I didn't know that my pastor was going to send that to all the churches in Australia. He actually wrote to me, say, hey, get, tell me what you guys are doing this year. So I sent him a thing. Uh, so I, I was uh, surprised that he did that, but uh, thankful. Uh, Luganville Baptist Church is continuing to grow. Uh, we're, uh, we're seeing um, up to between 10 and 15 visitors every Sunday are coming along to church. Uh, people are getting discipled. Uh, people are getting baptized. We uh, now have uh, four missionaries that as a church we support uh, full time. So uh, we, we support them fully. Uh, Abraham, Pastor Sylvain, John Ollie, John Vesa. Uh, these are guys who are on other islands going further into the jungle. Uh, I really believe that they can do a better job than I can. Uh, I can hike to the jungle. I used to do it as a teenager, but I believe that uh, a, better, a better approach is to train them uh, because when they go into the jungle, they're not telling wild stories of how difficult it was and, and the struggles because to them it's home. It's like, they're like, hey, what's wrong with you? You know, get over it. Eat the food. It's, it's good food. Uh, you know, oh, we all have diseases. What are you complaining about? It's kind of a, uh, how it's treated up there. Uh, most recently, this year, last year in November, um, John Vesa had been uh, with me for two years as an assistant pastor. And uh, we're able to ordain him and send him to another island called Banks Islands. Um, he's now uh, started two churches from there. And recently uh, he, he, he called me because I thought uh, with the cyclone that we had that surely uh, their whole place would be wiped out. And he actually called me and, uh, and he said, hey, we're, we're running a youth camp. Uh, I just want to know when, when my support comes in. Didn't even ask for us to raise extra money for him or anything. Uh, he was going to use his own support to, uh, to run a, a youth conference uh, throughout the holiday break there. And so uh, uh, things are going really well. They're seeing numerous people saved. Uh, we have some new missionaries from America. Uh, the Stokes, uh, they're from Pittsburgh. Uh, they were originally in PNG for two years and then they came to Vanuatu uh, to sort of look at, at uh, some different ministries that, had, that were available and uh, God really impressed on their heart to take up the work in Big Bay. Uh, to grow that work with the Bible school and Pastor Gabby and the multiple churches that are up there. So they just came in from America and uh, they're going to be starting to build up in the jungle. Uh, they're planning on translating the word of God into the Tiale language, which is the language that that people group uh, is about, uh, I think about 5,000 people that speak that language and they've never had it written. Um, Cyclone, thank you for praying about that. We did not get hit from it. Uh, some prayer points. I've had a truck that's been out of action since Feb. 
Uh, it's a Ford, nobody fixes Fords on our island, so we've gone from one mechanic to another mechanic to another mechanic to another mechanic. Um, so it's just kind of uh, uh, picking up dust there. We've kind of forgotten that we even have that vehicle, but just pray that uh, we're able to get that fixed. Uh, we're able to get a new work started. Actually, uh, Pastor Pollock uh, came off the plane. And, uh, you know, you look at people's uh, uh, web page photos and uh, they're usually about 10 years younger. I noticed that on Chris Hustler's advertising back there. I'm like, no, oh, that's, that's a photo from 10 years ago. And uh, so when the Pollocks came off the plane, we went, oh, we're not going to make it to Big Bay. Uh, it's a three hour trip. And if you have any, any bone problems at all, hip problems, knee problems, uh, you, you're going to be in a lot of pain after a six hour journey up there and back. And uh, so uh, uh, that, on top of the fact that it poured down rain because we had that cyclone coming in, um, our jungle day was, was almost cancelled. And uh, he was kind of upset about it because he really wanted to see the jungle. And, and we're upset because we want to take him up there and, and be able to preach to the people up there. And as we sat there and we're thinking, uh, God popped into my mind a, a village and a place that's been wanting a church for years and we've just never been able to coordinate it or have people to be able to follow it up and things and so I rang someone and one thing led to another than that afternoon because because their village you don't have to cross any rivers so I knew we could actually make it there and so we drove to South Santo uh, to the village of Narango and uh, we we're able to get up there uh, Pastor Pollock preached and uh, that afternoon, we're walking around looking at where we're going to build the church uh, for, a, for a future church plan up there. So uh, uh, God sort of orchestrated all that. So now we've got a, a new church plan in South Santo, uh, which is, it's really nice because it's only an hour drive, which uh, most of our jungle ministries are like three hours and then hiking. And this is like, it's really nice. You just drive up there and there's the church. It's, I'm like, Man, I, could, I could do this. This is simple. And so uh, a new church plant, plenty of people up there. Uh, we're planning on taking the medical team up there um, to be able to get that work started. Um, you always use, we always use teams and people that come over. We use it to get things started, to, to bring in people. Uh, in Australia, we have sausage sizzles or we find you know, fancy banners or we try and do something uh, to bring people to a church. Uh, Vanuatu is a lot simpler. We just take a bunch of you guys up into the jungle and that kind of attracts people. Uh, yeah. you're, the, you're the attraction. Um, so yeah, uh, continue to be in prayer uh, for those things. Uh, God is uh, certainly, uh, the work has continued. Uh, we haven't noticed any real adverse effects over, uh, over different things that have happened over the past year or so with uh, different missionaries stepping out of ministry. Uh, God's continued to bless the work and uh, we're always reminded that it's His work. Uh, sometimes we get concerned and we think, well, if I'm not going to be here, how's this going to continue? And then uh, God uh, very nicely sort of gently reminds you, hey, it's, it's my work. It's, it's not your work. Uh, you minus this, this continues uh, because it's my work. And uh, so uh, I want to talk about something uh, this morning uh, and uh, the idea of uh, do you know somebody? Do you know somebody? Uh, does anyone, anyone ever met someone famous or you know someone that's somewhat famous? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. Um, I, I, I uh, have a friend who's uh, in Sydney. Uh, you guys know this guy as well. He's, he's a bit famous, you know, uh, Timmy Manor. And uh, I remember one time he picked us up at the airport. He took us down to, uh, um, oh, what's that weird Lunar Park? Yeah, Lunar Park, that's right. We went down there and we were walking with him and Johnny Manor through Lunar Park and going on rides and stuff. And uh, it, was, it was kind of awesome walking around with somebody who's, you know, famous and you know people are <gasps> taking photos or they're whispering oh is that the matter boys you know and things like that and uh, and hanging out with them and uh, oftentimes in life it's it's always uh, it's uh, you you remember the person that you need when that time comes if you know somebody who's in the medical field uh, and someone gets sick chances are you're going to use that leverage you're going to be like oh i know I'll, I'll ring my you know so and so he's he's a doctor he's a really good friend of mine we use those sort of statements uh, if your car breaks down and uh, you happen to be a mechanic if you go to any church anywhere and you're a mechanic you've probably experienced this already you're the go-to person like you're just you're the you're the car whisperer like you will just they'll be able to explain to you on the phone and you'll be able to solve that problem uh, which doesn't happen, but uh, people think that, you know, oh, ring so-and-so, he'll, he'll be able to get this done, he'll be able to get this uh, fixed. I remember one time in Vanuatu, we had some issues with some paperwork, and I had a friend who we had sort of grown up together, 
Now he was in a government position. He was the, uh, the political, uh, uh, first p political advisor to the prime minister. And so, of course, I dropped him an email. Hey, buddy, how you doing? I'm having these issues with this dude. And he wrote back to me, on to it. I have a meeting with him next week. You know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, and you kind of use those things. You, you always remember who's the important person that you need to call. Uh, and uh, those things come to mind. If you know someone famous, uh, chances are uh, you're going to let people know, oh, yeah, I, kn I know that guy. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, him and I, we're friends. Yeah, we go way back, you know, when we're in school and, and whatever, you know, just don't tell him that he wasn't your friend and you actually never spent any time with him. Uh, but uh, we remember those things from there. It's funny uh, being in ministry, being a pastor, uh, people usually only call you up when like someone dies, uh, really serious car accident, someone's about to die. Um, let's see, uh, we want to get married and maybe someone's born, that's about it. So it, 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 it's good, good you're preaching a message on encouragement because uh, in ministry you can become very discouraged because you only hear all the bad news. It's like something really bad happens, ring pastor, tell him about it. Uh, you know, chances are people aren't calling you and saying, pastor, I got a promotion, good news, on Sunday there's going to be more money in the offering. Um, no, probably not. Or, hey, pastor, you know, we're going to go on this holiday. Uh, you know, I just want to let you know. Uh, usually you get all the bad news. All the, all the bad stuff sort of, sort of gets called up on you when those things happen. And uh, to know somebody famous is something that, uh, that we, uh, we as humans, it's just one of those things. And uh, here's, the, here's the thought process I want you to get this morning. And that is, uh, uh, well, first of all, uh, do you know somebody? Everyone knows somebody or someone. Uh, but more importantly, do you know the most important person? And of course, we're talking about Jesus Christ. Uh, to know Jesus Christ, to actually know that person, to know who he is. I want to think about, first of all, where is Jesus? Um, oftentimes when we think about Jesus and uh, we think about our Savior and uh, we get thoughts of him or we, we think about who he was, uh, sometimes with uh, uh, social media and, uh, and you know, movies that are being made and uh, uh, the Catholic pictures on the wall, you can get a concept of Jesus being uh, a very sort of soft-spoken person, a very uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, sort, of, sort of Gandhi type character that's very, you know, non-violence and, uh, and a very sort of a weak uh, kind of a person. Uh, but uh, I hope that you understand when you think about who our example is, uh, Christ came to this world to set an example for us. That's who we follow. We follow Christ on earth. The, the, the Christ, the man who set an example for us how to live as humans here on earth. But the person who we worship, the person who we pray to, the person who we think about is Christ sitting on his throne. Now, if you jump over into Revelations, it's a very different person than the person who came here on earth. Uh, who wouldn't slap when he was slapped, who, would, who was humble, who was meek, uh, who had all power but was under control. Uh, when you flash forward to Revelation, I mean, this guy's got flames coming out of his eyes. Uh, he's got, he's, I, I don't want to say this, but he's, he's got what seems to be tattoos on his legs, different names, and he's riding a horse, and he's got this, uh, you know, this, this uh, scepter medal. And uh, this guy's a very different person from uh, who we think of when we think of Jesus Christ. And uh, oftentimes, that can be why, uh, uh, as, uh, as men, sometimes we might find it hard to relate to, to Jesus uh, as someone who we would seem, who, who is this person who uh, you know, lets himself get slapped and things? I mean, uh, last I checked, uh, most of uh, the action heroes... Uh, that's the kind of guys that we look at, oh, awesome, you know, that strong guy, powerful, you know, you, you slap him and he slaps you and you go right through the wall. That's the guy, that's the guy that, that I would want to follow. That's the guy I want to imitate and put up on the wall. Uh, not, not the guy who, when you slap him, he, he, he doesn't slap you back and, and he's humble and meek. And, and uh, sometimes we can get this concept of who Jesus is and uh, we can get a, a misrepresentation that the Jesus who was on this world, that's who we follow. That's our example. Uh, the Jesus who is sitting on the throne right now is a very different person from that person that was, that was here on earth. Uh, a same person, but now he's all powerful. And in uh, Matthew 28, as he told his disciples, and he, he told them in uh, Matthew 28, as we think about the Great Commission, and we think about being in the book of Matthew, uh, especially uh, emphasizing the fact that Jesus Christ was uh, a king. 
Jesus as King and Lord and Savior. It tells us that, and then the eleven disciples went into Galilee, into mountain, in verses 16, where Jesus had appointed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came unto them, saying, what does he say unto them? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He tells them all power. All this power has been given unto me in heaven and earth. And then he tells them, go with this authority. Go with this power. I wonder often do we think as we uh, walk the streets and as we ponder whether we should tell people about Jesus Christ or not, do we consider the fact that we've been given authority from Christ? We've been given authority from God to do this. Uh, I, I know that uh, when a police officer pulls you over, he certainly feels like he's been given authority by the government to issue you a fine. Uh, he has the authority to arrest you. Uh, as you think about different people in authority, when you're in hospital, they have the authority to keep you there as long as they decide. Uh, and they'll make it very difficult for you to leave. Do we often, do we consider the fact that we've been given authority from God? We get scared, we get nervous. We think, oh, well, ah, this guy's going to think this, so he's going to think that. But we've been given authority from Jesus to go into all the world. So where is Jesus? We had a, a really good lesson in Sunday school. There was some theological stuff. I'm going to go home and have to think about uh, some of the things that were talked about. And here's uh, something that's uh, very theological when you think about it. Where is Jesus right now? Anyone? I know this isn't Sunday school right now, but this will keep you awake. Where is Jesus? In heaven. Okay, that's good. Wow, you get points for that. Uh, where specifically, what is he doing in heaven? Okay, he's seated on the right hand of the Father. So let's look at a few quick verses that tell us where Jesus is. Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verses 20 and to 20, 20 and 21, it says, Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and mights and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in the world, but also in that which is to come. This morning we, we learnt about the fact that uh, the, 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 the war, the spiritual war that we fight is not against physical things, but is against principalities and power. And, and here uh, it reiterates, hey, Jesus Christ is above these things. He is more powerful than this. And uh, we have a look at Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews with us, it tells us that he is our, our great uh, high priest in Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 1. It tells us, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So we, we see again where Jesus is seated in Matthew chapter, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 26 and verses 64. It tells us, Command, the, command therefore that the sepulchre be made sure. Wait, Matthew chapter 26, yep, verses 64, it tells us, Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the cloud of heaven. So we get this concept of Jesus sitting at the right hand. Now, we understand in, in our cultural context that the right hand speaks of power. It speaks of privilege. It's a, it's a place of honor. And uh, I, 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 I love this little story in Matthew chapter 20 and uh, verses uh, 21 where uh, uh, the disciples, and it's not just the disciples, but uh, uh, the disciples are, uh, are there speaking with Jesus. And uh, I have, I have uh, my mom and my mother-in-law here today. So, uh, you know, follow, following me as it were, they're, they're keeping me in check. They've got some papers. They're going to write notes about me. No, they, no, no, that's not going to happen. And uh, I can't say any of my mother-in-law jokes. Not that they would apply to you, mom. You're too good. So, uh, uh, you know, here we see... This, imagine this happening, okay? Verses 21. Uh, here comes mom. Mom comes along. Moms are always supportive of their son, always. And they always say, oh man, you should get that promotion. What? How? What? They gave that to somebody else? What in the world? And so here comes mom. Mom's going to say a thing or two. And uh, mom comes up to Jesus and, and Jesus in verses 21 says, what will that? What, what, what do you want? And she said unto him, Grant these my two sons, John and James, uh, uh, that my sons sit the one on the right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. Whew. That's pretty forward. 
Uh, it's funny, always be careful what you tell your mom because chances are she'll do something about it. Uh, I remember when I was in school, uh, our English class in French school, I pretended like I didn't know English because uh, it was going to be an easy, easy class. So, you know, when they say one, two, three, I'm going one, two, three, uh, you know, with the rest of my buddies trying to put my best French accent on. And uh, I, I had an oral exam that I didn't get 100% on. And uh, my English was better than the teacher's. And uh, so mom was like, what in the world? What is this French guy talking about? You didn't, how could you not get 100% on your oral exam? You're English. So she marched to school uh, to tell the teacher a thing or two, unbeknownst to me. And then uh, the teacher went, what? He speaks English. And so, you know, one thing led to another. <laughs> it didn't turn out too well for me. Um, Especially since all my tests became about history, English history. It had nothing to do with learning English after that. So it got very hard. Uh, but, you know, moms, moms are going to step in there for a son. And uh, so this mom comes along and says, hey, I, I, can, I, I want my sons to sit on the left and the right. She knows what she was asking. She was asking her sons to be put in the highest place of authority uh, on the side of Jesus. And uh, I love how Jesus turns around and he uses this as a, a teaching opportunity, and he always does. But Jesus answered and said, you know not what you ask. You don't understand what you're asking. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said unto him, we are able. And he said unto him, you shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on the right, my right hand and my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them to whom it is prepared of my father. So Jesus turns around and says, can you drink of my cup and baptize of my baptism? And, and they don't have a clue what he's talking about. Uh, but like good Bible school students, yes, yes, we can do that. Yep, we can do that. Uh, not realizing they've just agreed to uh, uh, going through some pretty serious suffering. Uh, they've just agreed to go through what he's going to go through. And then uh, as he finishes off this, uh, uh, the other disciples are sitting there and they're going, you know what, we're not following Jesus to get seated on the right hand and left hand. That's not why we're following this guy. We're not following this guy because we want to be sitting there reigning. And, and no, that's not what happens. It says, and when the ten, ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. How dare they? What? Did you hear what he just asked that guy? They were upset. They were angry. Why? Because they want to sit there. They, they, they want that position. Uh, they, they got upset. And then Jesus turns around and uses another opportunity. And, uh, and he talks about uh, how things are set up in the kingdom. Hey, if you want this position, you need to prepare, be prepared to go through this. You need to be prepared to go through some suffering. Uh, it's almost like the kingdom of God is, is very much the opposite to the world that we live in, uh, where you, know, you need to self-promote and you need to step up the ranks and you need to lie, deceive and cheat and do whatever you want. And, and you know, eventually you'll win the, win the rat race and you'll still be a rat. Uh, I hope you realize that, right? You win the rat race, you're still a rat. Uh, but uh, in Christ's kingdom, things are very different. He says, no, things, if you, you want to climb up, you want to you be something great, you're going to have to step down. You're going to have to be a servant. You're going to you're gonna have to go. F you're, it's very, very different. And so we see Jesus is, is, talks about us, him being seated at the right hand, a place of authority, a place of respect. Well, here's my question, and this is uh, uh, the, the main uh, place of my message in here, it Acts. Have a look with me in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, and let's see if we can notice something. Acts chapter 7, we have the, the story of Stephen being martyred. And in Acts chapter 7 and verses uh, 54, read from verses 54, it tells us. So he just finishes teaching and preaching. And, and uh, when they heard these things in verses 54, they were cut to their hearts and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Something about the word of God that just cuts at people's hearts. Uh, you can try this, and I've tried it once just for the fun of it. But uh, when you fly a lot, you get an opportunity to, to sit beside someone. And, and uh, you, if you're like me, uh, I don't like talking to people when I'm sitting on planes. It's just one of these things I like to sleep or read or something like that. But uh, you get next to a talkative person who's like, oh, what do you do? Oh, blah, blah, blah. And uh, you can try this. Uh, I've tried it before. 
On one instance, I decided that I would tell them that I was a director of an NGO and we uh, build water tanks and we uh, uh, help educate people in the jungle and we give out medicine. Man, that guy wanted to sign up. He was like, where's your website? Oh man, I'd love to give towards it. And this is incredible what you're doing. Oh, what an amazing life. You must be so fulfilled. Another person sits beside me. What do you do? I'm a Baptist missionary. I hike up into the jungle and I try to give the gospel to people and tell them about Jesus Christ. And, and it's like, oh, end of conversation. <laughs> so now I know, you know what? If I want to be left alone, just give them the gospel. <laughs> You know, if you said, oh, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Hindu guru, they'd be like, oh, yeah, oh, wow, oh, very interesting. Oh, that's amazing. But the moment that you say you're a Christian, something happens. If you say a Muslim, oh, they're really nice to you, especially if you're on a plane. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> but if you say you're a Christian, it's like there is something about the Word of God that just pricks at people's hearts. And it's either something that they're going to accept or it's something that they're going to say, oh, I just, I don't even, I didn't want to hear that. I didn't want to, I can't, you people, there's the words that come out. Say, well, uh, how do you know the word of God is powerful? Well, give it a try. <laughs> try tell, talking to people and see the reaction that you get from people, an instant, immediate reaction. They were, they, were, they were cut to their heart at the things that it was saying. It tells us in verse 55, but he being full of the Holy Ghost... shot out laser, laser beams out of his eyes and killed everyone. No, 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 no. Full of the Holy Ghost. What, what happens? Being full of the Holy Ghost, he was meek, humble. He was prepared for what was about to come. Looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing on the of God. And behold, he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with loud voices and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. The witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord, uh, 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 and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So here is this incredible story of one of the first martyrs of the early church, Stephen. And it's very, very detailed. It tells us exactly what happened and what transpired. But uh, did you notice something about what Stephen saw when he looked up into heaven? It tells us that when Stephen looked up into heaven, and it tells us in verses 55, he saw the glory of God and Jesus what was he doing? Standing on the right hand of God. Jesus is standing. Now, standing is, is very, uh, it's a very cultural thing, especially for uh, in our Western cultures. You stand as a sign of respect. Now, it's getting a lot less and less these days, but uh, if you would rewind uh, 30 or 40 years, it was a very big sign of respect. You stood uh, as somebody entered the room. If you've ever been in court, uh, you have to stand as the judge comes in, as a sign of what? What is it a sign of? It's a sign of respect. Uh, now in Vanuatu, we, we, it usually tends to be a sign of aggression. Uh, and so when you get into a village, you usually sit down. That's, that's a sign that we're, we're really good friends. We can trust each other. We can sit down. We can be off guard with each other. But here in, in the Bible, in the context of what was happening, Stephen looks up and he sees Jesus standing. And we'd, we'd been talking about, up to this point, Jesus being seated at the right hand of God. Why is Jesus standing? Why is Jesus standing? What made Jesus stand up? If you think about it, there's several things that I believe that made Jesus stand up. First of all, here's an interesting thing. Uh, Jesus is, is extremely interested in, in what is happening in your life. That's the first thing. Uh, sometimes we can get uh, a concept of God uh, and there's all sorts of different views of God that people can get and they, they, they frame the network of, of how you worship God or how you live in your life. And, and, uh, but there's some people who, who can, we can sometimes view God too big. So what, what do you mean? Well, sometimes we can view God that God is so big and he is so busy with everything that he is doing that surely he doesn't, isn't really concerned about 
the things that are happening in my life, the struggles that are happening in my life, the, the, the difficulties that are happening in my life. And, and uh, we just went through a study in, in, the, in the book of Job uh, with our church in Vanuatu. And, and uh, you see this in the life of Job where, where he knew who God was and how mighty God was. And because of that, he went, ah, maybe he's forgotten about me. Maybe he's kind of just, he's missed it. He, he doesn't know what's happening here. And I love it because when God comes along, he doesn't say, hey, Job. Guess what? We've been speaking about you in heaven. We've had some rejoicings when you, when you, when you made it through the first trial. Oh, yeah, when Satan came along and, and we say, hey, have you heard about my servant Job? We don't see that happen. God turns up on the scene and says, hey, Job, let me ask you some questions. Since you know who I am and exactly what I'm like, let, let's, let's, let's have some learning. Let's have some growth. I uh, often think as I study through it, why didn't Jesus just, why didn't God just tell him, hey, this is what happened to you. This is what happened in heaven. So that Job wouldn't be lifted with pride and walk around and say, hey, get out of the way. They're talking about me in heaven. Yep, I am, I'm like on the scene right now. No, God turned around and said, you know what, Job? You need to understand just how great and how interested in details I am. I mean, I, am, I know how you have on your head. Think about that. How many sand, grains of sand there are in the ocean? God is huge and incredible. And sometimes we can bring him too much to our level, but sometimes we can put him too much so that it's just, you know what? He's not really concerned about uh, this little difficulty or struggle that I'm going through. He's not really concerned that, that instead of using that as an opportunity to witness to that person, I decided to deny him. He's, he's not concerned about these uh, struggles. And, you know, uh, you know what? D don't tell pastor about, you know, the kids vomiting and that. Just listen. God's not concerned about those things. Let's just go to the doctors and bother them about it. But that's a, a wrong view of, of who God is. God is extreme. I mean, he knows when a bird dies in a jungle. I've been in the jungle. There's lots of birds in the jungle. No one cares when a bird drops dead in the jungle. God knows about that. And here we see that Jesus is watching what is taking place here on earth. Imagine if Stephen had not gone through what he had gone through. Imagine if Stephen had said, oh, yeah, wait, 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 don't, don't stone me. Jesus is watching exactly what is taking place. He's not only just wa not only watching, but he stands. He stands to, to receive or to honor what is taking place here on earth. Think about it. Jesus stood for Stephen. Why did he stand for Stephen? Because of the sacrifice that was being made. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 21, Paul talked about, he says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ and to die is gain. To live without Christ, it's not, not worth it. So it's to, to me, to live, it's got to be with Christ. And you know what? When I die, there's gain there. It, it, it's a good thing. Philippians chapter 1 and verses 21. As I, I, every time I read that verse now, I can't help but think of one of our pastors that was in the jungle who's now passed away, Pastor Reuben. He was pastoring uh, Valui Baptist Church, and uh, he actually had uh, liver disease for years, never told anyone, just suffered in silence. Uh, only a few people that were praying for him knew about it. And as he approached the end of his life, his family on his wife's side are all custom uh, witch doctors or people who use custom medicine and things. She's actually got a bone through her nose. Uh, pulled it out when she became pastor's wife. Uh, but uh, that's, that's the lifestyle that they have. And as he was dying, they approached and they said, Hey, let us use custom. We can make you live longer. We can give you a few extra days. We can give you a few months. We can, we can do this for you. White man medicine has failed you. Look at you. You're dying now. Come back to the old ways. And he was, he was lying on his deathbed. And it's... Always an interesting thing when you're faced with death. Uh, what people are willing to do to just get a few extra days, a, a few extra months, a few extra minutes. He turned around and he looked to them and he said, you know what? He quoted this as, he said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. 
He said, I, he said I, I would rather die with Christ than live even 10 minutes with the power of the devil. And as he passed away and he dropped into a coma, uh, they actually, a challenge was set forth between his church members and the witch doctors. And that was whoever, whatever truck was first to get to the body, they would have the body. And we didn't know this. And they called uh, some of our team members in town and said, hey, can you come pick up Pastor Ruben? He's fallen into a coma. We need to get him to the hospital. And then they called the witch doctors and the witch doctors and, and praise the Lord, our truck made it there first and recovered the body. And then he eventually passed away. And at his funeral, uh, people cried. And uh, it, was, it was very different from usual uh, morning ceremonies. Usually at morning ceremonies, they get angry and they're slamming the wall and they're crying out, where did you go? Why did you leave us? And at his funeral, they're actually crying out and saying, saying, Pastor, who's going to preach to us? Pastor, you, you loved us so much and, and now you're not with us anymore. And it was, a, it was very different from, there was hope. There was hope. You know what? Incredible sacrifice. Christ stood up because of the sacrifice that was being put forth. One, as we think about missions, as we think about serving Christ, is it costing us something? Is it a sacrifice? Or uh, do we have the uh, bare minimum mentality? Um, you know, there's, there's, there's no senior discount. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no special, you know, uh, thing in, in when we come to giving to the Lord. But I love this because this is how it's set up in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 17. It tells us, and, uh, and this is incredible because if, if we were to set up a system, it certainly wouldn't be this way. And uh, it's, it says, according to what you have, in, according to what you have, according to what you've been blessed with. That means that people in Vanuatu can give just as much, if not more, than people here in Australia. Because giving is not based on a monetary amount. Giving is based according to what we have and what we have been blessed with. I wonder, as we think about, and you're coming into a month of thinking about missions, has it... Has it been a sacrifice? Is it something that uh, you're, you're giving towards Christ? Uh, do you think that Jesus has ever stood? And we don't want to think that way. Ah, I made Jesus stand up. But, but as we think about that concept, the incredible sacrifice, and Stephen was laying down his life. And as we give to missions, as we, as we give to people, we're, we're trusting them. We're, we're, we're trusting them with a lot. And we're actually saying, hey, you know what? Um, I can't do it, but I want you to. And just as hard as I'm going to work on Monday through to Friday, I expect you missionary to be sacrificing as much. And uh, in reality, if we get this concept, we, those who, who are going out ought to be sacrificing just as much as those who are giving. It not, ought not to be them sacrificing everything and, and uh, we sacrifice a little bit, and we still have our, our exactly, we live exactly the same as the neighbor across the road. The incredible sacrifice is what made Jesus stand. Stephen was giving it all. He was giving his life. The next thing that happened, the gospel was about to go to all the world. The gospel was about to go to all the nations. We know in Acts 1.8 that the church in Jerusalem was commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And I've often uh, I've often myself preached through uh, what the church of Jerusalem was doing. They were, you know, preaching and they were hearing the doctrine and they were growing and things were happening. But I only recently noticed this, that there was something they weren't doing. We can look at what they were doing and saying, oh, really good church. Look at all the things that they're doing. Incredible. But in the meantime, Christ last command to them was, hey, get out. And now he's sitting on the throne going, you're still in Jerusalem. You're still in Jerusalem, guys. What's going on? This is pretty, yeah, it's exciting for you. There's a really big church. There's, I'm sending more and more people, but you're just keeping them. It tells us that what happens as you read through Acts chapter 8 and you read through this persecution, what was about to take place, meant that the church exploded split, as it were, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at the time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria. How did the church get out? Through Stephen. 
being martyred, through the persecution that was about to take place, through hardship that was about to take place. You know, we never think this way, but sometimes God might allow some persecution to come into our lives to move us to where he needs us to be. Uh, I, I know for a fact that there are many times where difficulties and hardships have, have come into to our lives and ministry that have actually put us in a place that we would have never planned on being to get the gospel to people that we never intended on meeting. God will allow things to come into our lives so that the gospel gets out into all the nations. As exciting as it was, in Acts chapter 2 and 43 to 47, you can read through all the things that were happening. They weren't getting the gospel out. It's always a scary thing for a church to be doing lots and lots of things, but getting the gospel out is, ah. oh yeah, that's that church down the road. They're, they're all about getting the gospel out. Uh, where about this over here? Where about this? Or where about this? And uh, as you go to the mission field, it's, it's a weird thing, but you get to have a a distant perspective of what's going on in Australian churches. Because you're over there and you've gone there exactly the same and you're still working and growing and you're doing what you were sent there to do. And you look back and you get to see all these fads and now it's like some spinny thing here in Australia. Like I'm like, what in the world is that? That's ridiculous. Last time I was here is some Pokemon walk around with your phone thing. As we would say in Vanuatu, you feel like white man, you feel like cranky. You, know? <laughs> you guys are crazy. Like what are you guys doing? You know? The churches go through fads as well. It'll be this one thing, everyone's standing, oh, we're all going here, then it'll be this one thing over here, and it'll be this one thing over here. And sometimes it's at the expense of pushing those things that are important to the side. You want, hey, pastor, yeah, yeah, the gospel's important, uh, but what about the people that are here? Hey, the, the, you know what, the, the gospel, yeah, yeah, the bus and the kids coming in, yeah, 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 but, but what about... What about those of us who've been, you know, what about, you know, us here? What about this or what about that or what about that? The gospel is about to get out into the nations. Jesus stood because the gospel was about to get out. And lastly, why did Jesus stand? Jesus stood because more would follow. Here's Stephen about to die. The church is about to suffer incredible persecution, which will then spread them into other places where they will take now the gospel with them. And uh, they didn't intend on being missionaries to those places, but it just happened through persecution. And uh, here, there's a man standing there named Saul. And they're laying their coats at his feet, and he's watching this take place. He's watching this, this take place. And, uh, and uh, God, Jesus is standing because, hey, you know what? This person is going to be affected by this. When somebody sacrifices, it's, it just has an effect. It just sort of onflows to other people as it goes along. Acts chapter 7 and verses 58. And they said, They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their cloths at a young man's feet whose name was Saul, who would later become the apostle Paul. I remember in the early stages of ministry, we uh, started working with Pastor Gabby. And um, he asked me, he said, what's, what's the purpose of the church? And, you know, I used all the typical answers that we get from Bible school, you know, to glorify God and to uh, equip the believers and, to, and I'm going through all these things. And uh, after about two years of teaching him everything that I sort of was taught uh, on the subject and reading books and things, uh, there was one night we were just talking uh, around a campfire, I, I don't even really remember this incident, but he does, where we were just talking about, you know, youth program, and he didn't have any youth in his church, but he was trying to run a youth program because that's what the Protestants had, had taught them that they have to do, and he was trying to run a women's group program because that's what you're supposed to do, and he had all these different things happening in his church, and we were talking about the gospel, and out of nowhere, he just goes, I get it. I, I, I finally get it. It's about getting the gospel. We have this program. Why? Because we want them to understand the gospel. We have this program. Why? Because we want them to be able to get the gospel. We have this program. Why? Because we want them to be able to get it really good so they can take it and give it to others. And out of nowhere, he went. He had an aha moment. And from there, his ministry completely changed. 
We have a month of focusing on missions. That's really exciting. Not a lot of churches have a special time where they set aside and say, hey, we're going we're gonna to do this event. We're going we're gonna to do this time where we're going to think about missions. But I hope that it's not just the one month. I hope that this is something that is continually brought to the front. Hey, how, how are we doing with this? How, how, uh, how are we doing? I wonder today as we think about Jesus standing, I wonder if your life has ever made Jesus stand in anticipation, in honor of what's taking place. As he received sacrifices from his servants, Jesus stood. He stood up because the gospel was getting out and he stood up to point out Saul, those who would follow. I wonder if our sacrifice for the Lord has ever made Jesus stand. I wonder if... uh, If as a church, our spread of the gospel has ever made Jesus stand. As we think about it, all authority was given unto him. We often, so often we run to the people that we know. Or we talk about the famous person that we met. Take a selfie, whatever, tell all your friends, get a signature. But I wonder if uh, we truly grasp who Jesus Christ is that he's seated at the right hand of God. We talked about this this morning. We live in, it's a spiritual warfare. And oftentimes we make it a physical. This is just physical. Oh, I got a headache. I didn't drink enough water. I got to take some Panadol. Oh, I got this thing. Oh, that's just this. Oh, my car broke down because I didn't service it. And we, we, don't, we, we miss that opportunity to realize, hey, we don't walk by sight, but we walk by faith. This is something that we go to Jesus We go to Jesus. He ought to be the first person we call. He ought to be the first person we talk to. And he ought to be the first and most important person that we tell other people about. Hey, have you ever met someone famous? Yeah, I I met Jesus. He's he's changed my life. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this opportunity this morning to be able to share your word. Heavenly Father, I pray that you might just... uh, Help us to pause and consider the greatness of who you are. Jesus, you're so incredible and amazing and beyond what we could ever comprehend or understand. And you came to this world, dear Lord, so that you could set an example for us of how to live in the midst of this world. An example for us to follow, dear Lord, as we serve you here on earth. Jesus, I pray that you might help us to understand who you truly are seated on the right hand of God, that we have access to you. We have access to the most incredible power we could ever seek to want or deserve, dear Lord. We have access to you, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I pray that this morning we might just be in awe of who you are and how incredible you are, dear Lord. I pray that we might not lose sight of it. Dear Lord, I pray that as we sacrifice, as we Make decisions for you, dear Lord, and if it were that we had to sacrifice the ultimate sacrifice, that our eyes would be set on you, Jesus. Dear Lord, I pray that you might help us, as Stephen did, to forgive those who have done ill towards us. Dear Lord, I pray that as a church, the Great Commission, taking the gospel to the world, might never be relegated to a third or a fourth or a a fifth agenda on the church, dear Lord, but will always remain as the life force, dear Lord, as the beating heart of this church. Dear Lord, I pray that as individuals, as we consider what we sacrifice, dear Lord, to follow you, I pray that we might continually keep our eyes rested on you. I pray that we might continue to seek you, Jesus Christ, in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.